My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. The following event took place on a camping trip during the summer of 2014 in the great state of Wisconsin. We were camping midweek to avoid the crowds that are all too common in the popular campsites during the summer. In 2011, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Madison is a town that I have loved dearly ever since first stepping foot in it. The summers in Wisconsin can get really humid, so we made a bit of a habit going to a nearby campground called Devil's Lake Campground. It was sort of an annual tradition, and a great one at that. However, 2014 was a year that I was sort of looking to expand my horizons and try a different campground. I'm embarrassed to admit that up until that point, Devil's Lake was the only place I had ever camped. After doing some research, I came across a tranquil-looking place called Sand Hill Station Campground. Seeing as how there were still plenty of campsites available, I made my reservation, and before you knew it, my pit bull, Luna, and I were off on our adventure. Little did we know what we were in for. We pulled into the campground on a Tuesday afternoon. Luckily, I have a lenient job that allows me to pretty much work from wherever I please. So I like to take advantage of it and tend to schedule weekday trips to avoid the crowds and all the wound up children that often tag along with them. Luna seemed to be acting a bit different after I parked. Normally, she comes launching out of the back seat as soon as I unlatch the door handle, but this time was different. It was almost as if she had been waiting for me to tell her the coast was clear or something. This was very odd behavior, but I was excited to have arrived at what turned out to be a beautiful location. So I just shook it off and told myself that she had only hesitated because we were in unknown territory. Luckily, Luna seemed to ease up a bit and began to explore the area. I spent the next 20 minutes or so setting up a tent and inflating the mattress, while my pup casually sniffed at the surrounding grass. All was calm, and a bit later, while we were tossing her frisbee, something in the outer brush of our campsite seemed to get her attention. She bolted towards the edge of the tall grass meadow. I called out after her, but she ignored me. I made a real effort to get her back to the tent, but she refused to budge and just kept staring into the brush. After calling her name a few more times, I gave up and decided to just walk the hundred feet to where she stood. I suppose I was kind of lost in my head as I slowly walked over to her. I was so taken aback by the beauty of the colorful meadow that surrounded us that the fact something had spooked her not long before never really registered to me. I didn't feel concerned in the slightest. It just seemed as though nothing bad could happen in such a serene place. I called out to her playfully as I walked the last few feet towards her. I assumed that she had heard either a possum or raccoon rummaging through the brush, but when I kneeled next to her, her whole body began to quiver and she let out a muffled growl. It seemed like she wanted to flex her muscles, but was worried where that would lead. I couldn't help but wonder if her instinctual desire to protect her master was influencing her once I stood by her side. After a few seconds of everything being silent, apart from her soft, menacing growls, I was tripped up by this awful feeling, a feeling that I can only describe as utter dread. As I stood up, I lightly tugged on her collar to redirect her from the edge of the brush. We took a few steps back towards the campsite, and that's when we heard the noise. My heart was suddenly pounding. It sounded like a rhino charging through the forest. Branches snapped, ferns and prairie grass rustled, and the ground shook. Luna went crazy and let out vicious-sounding barks that I have never heard her make before. I was so terrified that I couldn't move, but I kept a tight grip on her collar, as the thought of her taking off into the woods was too much to bear. I held my breath, and I initially thought that the animal had decided to pounce as soon as our backs were turned. But as the noise faded, 
I quickly realized that the animal was actually headed in the opposite direction. Even though I was fairly creeped out, there was a part of me that wanted to peel back some of the prairie grass to see if I could catch a glimpse of anything. Since it was summer, the sun was still high in the sky, and I think that's the only reason I was able to keep it together. Otherwise, I likely would have taken shelter in my car, at least until it became evident that the coast was clear. I decided to take a break from the campsite, so I took a stroll around the rest of the campground with Luna by my side. Whatever had just occurred, I hoped that a walk would get not only my pup's mind off of it, but mine as well. After scoping out the area, we crossed paths with a couple who I could tell were both a bit older than I was at the time. I asked them if they were aware of any bears or larger animals in the area, but they hadn't heard of anything. I did notice that they didn't have any dogs in their company. Things seemed to have returned to normal once we made it back to our site. It wasn't until later that evening, while Luna and I were relaxing by the fire, that it seemed like something was on her mind. She'd lie her head down in the grass one moment, and then she would quickly lift it up and her ears would go forward, as if something had caught her attention. Though I wasn't seeing or even hearing anything out of the ordinary, this pattern continued for the remainder of the night until we finally went inside the spacious tent. I can remember falling asleep with close to no trouble, but at some time in the middle of the night, I was woken by the uncomfortable sensation of Luna's large torso driving into my ribs. What's more, she was quivering. This was especially odd, given that it was a particularly warm night. Additionally, this was a Midwestern dog who was never phased by snow and cold weather. I asked her what her deal was, and I had just finished hissing at her when I heard it. The chatter. It sounded like a strange foreign language that I had never heard before, and it couldn't have been further than ten feet from our tent. At the time, I was ignorant enough to suspect that a couple of Eastern Europeans had, for whatever reason, taken an interest in my vehicle or supplies. But the oddest part of this chatter was how it sounded as though its positioning was ever-changing. There'd be a few seconds where it sounded like it was coming from the fire pit, and then only seconds after that, it sounded like it was coming from the other side of my tent. There was something about it that was so steady, almost as if whoever was responsible was simply floating from one position of the campsite to another. I didn't hear even a single footstep, even though I was listening for them. Eventually, I grew restless and got sick of trying to work out what was going on, so I decided to casually call out, who's out there. I didn't yell it or anything like that. I just said it loud enough so that anyone who was near the tent would notice. Everything fell silent. The only sound that remained audible was our breath. I'll tell you, that might have been the part that freaked me out more than anything. I guess I had hoped to hear some sort of sign that whoever was out there was leaving my campsite, but there was nothing of that kind. With Luna still violently shaking, perhaps even more than before, I decided to unzip the screened-in tent window so that I could get a peek at whoever was still out there. Aside from the starlit sky, all that I initially noticed were the usual shapes of what you'd typically see at the campsite. A car, a picnic bench, the grill, trees, boulders. It wasn't until I was about to re-zip the screen that Luna explosively launched herself off the mattress and began to bark ferociously. This aggression was, again, unlike anything I had ever seen from her. She had always been a very quiet and laid-back dog up until that point. As I was trying to prevent her from ripping through the expensive tent, I saw a large shape move not too far from the edge of the surrounding meadow. I had no idea what the thing was, but I quickly assessed that it was down on all fours and that it didn't resemble any animal that I knew to be in existence. As stunned by the sighting as I was, it was incredibly challenging to restrain my overly excited dog, whilst also trying to make out the details of the creature at the same time. 
I managed to unhook the small flashlight that hung from a carabiner attached to the roof of the tent. As I aimed the light in the general direction of the animal, I was surprised to see that it didn't quickly flee. It just kind of moseyed along the perimeter of the meadow before letting out a peculiar sounding hiss in our direction. It was right then and there that my senses informed me that this thing was more man than animal, and judging by its size, I was confident that this had to be what was responsible for the stampede through the brush earlier in the day. In the bright light from the flashlight, I could see that it had tangled hair, as opposed to fur, which gave me the impression that it might be somehow related to a caveman or a Neanderthal. I should mention that the idea of Bigfoot did cross my mind, but I knew very little about the subject back then. I had assumed that the species could only be found in California, and that if there was more than one of them, they all looked like the one in that famous video by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. From what I saw of this creature, it didn't look much at all like that thing. Unfortunately, I only got a very quick look at its face, and I didn't see its teeth, but I do recall seeing a wider-than-usual nose. All of its features seemed wider than most humans. Still, it's hard to imagine any kind of human running around there on all fours. After it let out the hissing noise, it walked a few more steps along the edge of the meadow before slipping between the tall grass, and we never saw it again. To this day, I'm still not positive whether the hiss was a response to the light or to Luna's aggression. However, those who I've told of the encounter have urged me to never shine a light directly into any animal's eyes again. Apparently, this can trigger some species to charge. One more thing that I found interesting is how the chatter never picked back up after I unzipped the window screen. If it was talking, I guess part of me has always wondered why the creature didn't make any effort to communicate with me. My encounter with the Sasquatch species happened back in 1999, while I was canoeing on a river in Washington State. I was with my son, who was in high school at the time, and this incident is something that we still talk about to this day. Frankly, I've always thought the event to have brought us closer together. My son went through a phase where he was really into the sport of kayaking. We're from the state of Michigan, and until he was old enough to drive, we'd spend many summer weekends kayaking various rivers within the state. Even though he had a lot of fun on those trips, he would often mention how he wanted to paddle some extraordinary river out in Colorado or the Pacific Northwest. Well, then his birthday rolled around, and I surprised him with the itinerary for a trip to Washington for that upcoming month of June. The kid was ecstatic, and it was an overwhelmingly satisfying feeling to see just how much joy that gift brought his way. Of course, I had no clue that this trip would be memorable for a variety of reasons. My wife has never been much of an outdoorsy type, but she was always very encouraging of my son and I to get out there and enjoy what nature has to offer. And even though she wasn't interested in participating, she was extremely supportive and would ask our son to tell her all about the trips. I want to say we had been camping in Washington for nearly a week. For whatever reason, we decided to switch things up a bit by renting a canoe rather than the duo of single-person kayaks. This way, we were aboard the same vessel, which made it easier to maintain discussion as we observed and admired our surroundings. These types of trips are truly perfect for bonding with your loved ones. There seems to be something about being immersed in nature that sparks great conversation. It encourages you to drop your guard and speak up about any insecurities you might have. It's probably needless to say that a barrage of anxieties often torments teenagers, and this is when I learned from my son that he was embarrassed about how small he was in comparison to so many of the other boys his age. Luckily, I was able to communicate to him that I went through the same thing at his age and would end up going through a growth spurt only a year later, something that I should mention would end up happening to him around the same time. 
If you're parenting teenagers as you read this, I highly recommend you take them on this type of journey. I think it's inevitable that you'll grow even closer. Anyway, enough of the why we were on this trip. Allow me to explain what made this journey unforgettable. We had been paddling for a couple of hours, and I want to say we were a little less than halfway finished with the route. I can vividly recall how our dialogue was abruptly interrupted by the sounds of birds fleeing from a couple of trees that were off to the right side of the river. Both of us swiveled our heads in the direction of the commotion, and immediately we saw multiple dark shapes that were running along the terrain that was only a little bit above the river bank. Of course, our paddling came to a halt. At first, I could only assume we were looking at a large group of black bears. However, I knew enough about bears to know that they weren't pack animals. Additionally, though these entities were on four limbs, they weren't moving in ways that bears do. There was something about the limbs that reminded me of the way monkeys run throughout the treetops. It was very nimble. From where our canoe was positioned, there looked to be at least ten of these creatures. Their feet didn't seem to make much noise when they touched the terrain, but we were able to hear a series of strange grunts, growls, chirps, and even whistles. The noises that these creatures made didn't resemble anything I had ever heard before. Although it was clear that they were heading in the same direction as us, One would sometimes circle another one and nudge it with its hand or torso before resuming what almost seemed like a race. Whatever they were, they seemed like a very social bunch. I don't remember feeling scared at the time. Perplexed would be the more appropriate word. However, there was something about my son's body language that made it obvious he was pretty intimidated by what we were seeing. Hey man, it's all right, I whispered to him. We're fine. They can't touch us while we're out here. But it was as I returned my gaze to the riverbank that I saw two of the entities were now standing in the water on two feet and looking at us in silence. I somehow hadn't even heard anything step into the water while I was speaking to my boy. Since there was now a length of about 40 yards between us and the physically intimidating creatures, My gut told me to start paddling closer to the opposite side of the river. However, another inner voice warned me that it wouldn't be wise to show my son that I was feeling frightened. On the other hand, I was quickly growing more and more worried about what I was supposed to do if these large creatures were to charge our canoe. Even with the other creatures continuing to move about in the backdrop, There was something about the two entities that stood in the water. They were just so stoic and statuesque. Another thing that sticks out in my memory is how there appeared to be an absence of color in the eyes. Of course, it would have been the distance that divided us from them, but they just looked like black marbles. Both my kid and I agree that their faces had human characteristics. To me, They looked like extra-wide human faces, with notably high foreheads. In other words, I suppose you could say that they looked how I would imagine early humans to look. I wasn't able to make out what the contents of their mouths were like as their lips were closed. I'm not sure whether it was because the lips were so large, but the shape made it appear as though they were pouting. These things were as barrel-chested as could be, equipped with long but muscular arms. Since the lower portions of their legs were submerged, I was unable to see if the feet were as gigantic as some others say. The natural current of the river continued to take us further away from the creatures, but it was probably around ten minutes later that we again spotted them running on all fours near the river bank. I didn't mention it to my son, but I was becoming worried that we were their primary interest. I thought, what if they're hunting us? What could I possibly do to protect my teenage son? After that second sighting, we never would see them again. The idea of Bigfoot wasn't the first thing to cross my mind. I was well aware of the subject, but I suppose I grew up assuming there was only one of them, 
akin to the Loch Ness Monster. When I think back on it, that assumption was a bit ridiculous. How could there possibly only be one specimen out there? When we first spotted these entities racing through the woods, I guess I assumed we were looking at some other kind of rare species that hadn't been documented yet. It's never been clear to me whether it was because of that incident or not, but my son seemed to grow out of his kayaking obsession after that trip. It was at a point in his life where he started spending a lot more time with girls, so that could easily be the reason. Since then, my son and I have watched a boatload of documentaries that revolve around the subject. We've even met up at a couple conventions, and would probably have done more if timing always permitted. Whenever I'm at those types of gatherings, I can't help but wonder how many attendees have had their own experiences with this species. That's an idea that's always intrigued me. I don't think we'll ever know with 100% certainty that we saw a group of Sasquatch that day, but all these years later, I still have yet to come across a single practical explanation. Whatever they were, they must be at the very top of the food chain. My story took place in the summer of 2010, in early August. I was in between jobs, as in unemployed, so I decided to take some of my savings and do something I've always wanted to do, go to Canada. I've always wanted to see the Canadian Rockies. So I got my passport, and since I have three dogs, I got their shots all current, along with the veterinarian exam papers that Canada requires. After all of that, I was never asked to see the dog's papers, but I sure didn't want to risk not being legal. I live in Wyoming, so I decided to just head north and see the country at a leisurely pace. I went through Yellowstone and finally arrived in Glacier National Park about three weeks later. I was an old hand at camping, having done it since I was a kid. I was camped kind of illegally in Glacier, way out on a back dirt road off the highway that loops from St. Mary's around to Hungry Horse. It was a sweet camp, and I'd set up my big tent and all, and I knew nobody ever went there because the grasses were growing so high you could barely find the road, which ended at my campsite. And man, what views. I could look down and see St. Mary's Lake and huge distant waterfalls from my tent door, it was paradise. Because of finding this great spot, I decided I'd go up into Waterton National Park and make it a one-day trip instead of packing up and trying to find a camp spot there. A friend who had been up there told me that the park would be very crowded at that time of year. I wanted to spend most of my time in Canada in Banff and Jasper National Parks, and I wanted to backtrack through Montana and cross the border north, so I wanted to come back down that way anyway. No need to change camps. I got up really early, made some coffee, filled my thermos, fed the dogs, grabbed some lunch stuff, and then we all jumped into my pickup and headed for Canada. It was a beautiful drive. I still couldn't believe the size of these mountains. Even though I'd just been in Glacier, they seemed bigger and even more magnificent. I made it into Waterton, and boy, I was disappointed. The park advertises itself as a quiet, untrammeled place, and I suppose it is in general. But the little town of Waterton is a tourist trap. It was hard to even find a place to turn around, and the streets were packed with people walking around, with nowhere to even park. I drove around a bit, checked out the little waterfall, and left heading for Cameron Lake, which is at the end of a windy road that climbs high in the mountains above Waterton. The lake was beautiful, with a white glacier hanging above its far shores, but once again, it was crowded with people. I was too busy watching the road and dodging RVs to even see much of the scenery, and there were almost no places to turn off and get out, so that was kind of a blur. I decided to go see a place called Red Rock Canyon. It was the opposite direction from how I'd come into the park, so I turned left at the bottom of the hill 
and let everyone else go on back to Waterton. Good riddance. The Canadian Rockies are all sedimentary rocks, not granite or volcanic, which makes them truly spectacular because they have lots of layers and colors. Red Rock Canyon sounded like a place I should see. Before long, I came to a turnout that had a historical marker, so I stopped there. I read the marker, and I can only recall that it was something about the natives there and some explorer, but I don't recall anything about who or when. I let the dogs out for a minute, and they went into the bushes and did their thing. Then I decided this would be a great spot for them to get out for some exercise. I was kind of wishing I'd just stayed at my camp in Glacier, as we would have had a nice day just goofing around, but on the other hand, at least I'd seen Waterton now, or a bit of it anyway. We headed up a big hill that appeared to be part of the foothills of a big mountain that rose above them. I mean a really big mountain. It was beautiful, all layered in various shades of red. The dogs were really happy to be out, and we all kind of bounded up on this big hill for a bit. I had to stop and catch my breath, and the views were so stunning. I was really enjoying this, and now liking Waterton, and so were the dogs. But all of a sudden, the dogs stopped cold. They just stood there, looking ahead, and as I came up behind them, I could see that the one closest to me, Otis, was shaking. I've never seen my dogs shake. I then noticed they were all shaking. Before I could even say a word, two of them had turned and were hightailing it back to the truck as fast as they could go. We hadn't come very far, so they were back there really fast, and I could see them crawling under the truck. Now Otis was running back too. He was very protective of me, and I've never seen him do anything like that. I decided it must be a big grizzly bear, and maybe they could smell it, where I couldn't, and I'd better pay attention, so I was soon also heading back at a good clip. I unlocked the truck and everyone jumped in, which was unusual, as I typically have to get after them. They always want to fiddle around, smell everything. I jumped in and locked the doors. Now I started scanning the hill, wondering why we were all so scared. I finally rolled down my window, but I didn't hear or see anything. By now, another car had pulled up to read the sign, and they smiled at me and got out and acted like everything was fine. I was puzzled. What had the dog sensed or smelled? I've been a bit of a photographer since I was a kid, so I was kind of hoping this grizzly would come out to where I could get some photos, from the safety of my truck anyway where I could get away fast. I sat there a bit, even though the dogs were again shivering. I have a club cab, and Sonny and Maggie were in the back, hiding on the floor. My dogs are all labs, and they're happy-go-lucky, and I don't think they think enough about things to get scared much. Even fireworks don't usually bother them. So I knew this had to be something really scary. I rolled the windows back up. The other car left. I started the pickup and turned it so I could make a quick getaway if needed. I then turned off the truck and just sat there. Whatever it was, it was still around, according to the dogs. And I got my camera ready to go. By now, it was getting on towards late afternoon. It had been a long day, and I wanted to take a picture of this grizz, and then I would head back to Glacier. Just then, something huge jumped onto the back of my truck. I have a camper shell, so whatever it was, it had to have jumped onto the bumper. The whole front end of the truck came up, including the front wheels. We just hung there in the air for a minute. I was shocked, and I dropped my camera. I couldn't see what was holding the truck up, but it was something big. I hadn't seen it coming which was really strange, as I kept looking around and in the rearview mirrors. Just then, I heard a braking sound. My truck was falling apart. The front came down with a wham, and I nearly smashed my nose on the steering wheel. I had the presence of mind to start the truck and slam it into gear 
and peel out while I could. Dirt and rocks went flying into the air, and I know they must have hit this thing in the face, as it had to be standing directly behind me. As I peeled out onto the blacktop, I felt something slam against the side of the truck, and I saw a big tree branch rolling down the road behind me. By then, I had the accelerator floored and was quickly getting up speed. But not fast enough, because I noticed something in my passenger side rear mirror, and this really shook me up. Something big and human-like was chasing me, wearing a fur coat, and it had nearly caught up. It looked like it was trying to grab onto the door handle. I reached down and hit the auto lock, making sure all the doors were locked. Otis was whining his head off in the seat beside me. Maggie and Sonny were still on the floor, so I couldn't see them at all. By now, my truck had ramped up, and we were finally able to leave this thing behind. I never did get a really good look at it, but I can tell you this. It was no grizzly. What I did see was that it was huge and covered in light brown long flowing hair. It was a Canadian Sasquatch, and you can believe me or not, but it doesn't matter anyway, because I know what I saw. I drove like a madman towards Red Rock Canyon, the direction I had the truck pointed. I'd forgotten the road would be closed, so I was surprised when I got a mile or two down the road and saw a flagger ahead wearing orange. It was a woman, and she stopped me and told me I had to turn around and go back. I was in shock, and I told her I couldn't turn around and go back. I hardly knew what I was saying. She said I had to turn around as they were working on the road. I just sat there. Finally, another car came up behind me, so I decided I would turn around and then follow it back. There was no way I was going through that stretch of road alone. I turned around and pulled over to let the other car go around me. It then dawned on me that I should get out and see how much damage my truck had taken. And what I saw really messed with my mind. My entire bumper was gone. And there was a big dent where the tree branch had hit, just above the wheel well. It also dawned on me that I needed to get that bumper back as it had my license plate on it. I would get pulled over with no plate, and what was I to say, that a Sasquatch had torn it off? I had to stop back there and get it, but I couldn't, there was no way. About then, a pickup came along with Montana plates, and I flagged it down. I explained that I'd lost my bumper back down the road, and I needed someone to help me load it into my truck. The driver was a real nice guy, he looked like a rancher or something, and he said he would. I hoped I wasn't getting them involved in something bad. But when I got to the pullover, I slowed down, did a quick look around, and pulled over. Sure enough, my bumper lay there, all twisted up, but the plate was still on it. I hoped the Squatch had moved on. The guy from Montana got out and asked me what had happened, but I couldn't tell him the truth. So I said I'd backed into a rock and hadn't realized it until later. He looked skeptical, but helped me load it into the back of my truck. I couldn't wait to get out of there, especially after I smelled a strong skunky odor. I thanked him, and then he asked me if I was okay. I decided to tell him the truth, so I quickly told him what had happened. He commented on the strong odor, and then jumped into his truck and drove away. I think he believed me, and I was right behind him. The drive back was a blur. I don't really remember anything, not even the border crossing. By the time I got back to Montana and the little resort town of St. Mary, I had had it. There was no way I have the courage to go back to my camp, so I rented a room. No matter that it was really expensive, and I had to sneak the dogs in, I really didn't care. The next day, I drove back to my camp. What I saw scared me. All around the tent were huge bear tracks. I know it was a grizzly. It hadn't bothered anything, but had just walked around a bunch. I was then glad I'd stayed at the motel, because if I'd come back, who knows what would have happened. Maybe that's why nobody had camped there for so long. 
It was prime Grizz territory. I packed everything up and headed home. I'd go see Banff and Jasper another day, which I did, but from the comfort of motel rooms at night. I've never camped since, except in the desert, but I've often wondered if that Squatch hadn't felt like I did that day, sick of tourists everywhere. It was 2009 when I saw a Sasquatch in Washington. I went out there to visit my sister, who was unfortunately going through an ugly divorce. Her son was eight years old at the time, and I wanted to show them both a bit of support. I had been there for probably about a week, and I remember my nephew was wrapping up his spring break from school. It was when my sister went to go drop him off, that I decided to capitalize on a beautiful day and take one of their old bicycles for a ride on one of the nearby trails. I found the most serene path that was meant to lead me to the bay. However, I wouldn't end up making it that far. I had probably pedaled three or four miles when I suddenly gasped at something so astonishing. I still have trouble putting it into words. Off to the right of the trail, was what I initially thought was a very tall black bear standing on its hind legs, though I knew the size was far too large for a black bear, and the color of its fur was too dark to belong to a grizzly. The confidence must have come from the fact that I was indeed on a bicycle, but I managed to pull over and stare at this thing. Less than a second later, I deeply regretted pulling over to get a better look. I want to say the face looked more like human than ape, yet there was something about it that reminded me of neither. It was like it was its own thing entirely. As soon as I made eye contact with this thing, it was like its presence entranced me. I remember its lips opening just wide enough to display two rows of chipped and crooked teeth. It was while it was showing its teeth that it unleashed this muffled hiss. Honestly, it sounded more like a loud purr from a household cat, but it was the curve of its brows that made it obvious that it wasn't at all charmed by my presence. Even though I stayed focused on its face, I still recognized that it had an overwhelmingly muscular torso. Imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday, only much taller and covered with a dense coat of black hair. That's something that has always amazed me about this. Even with that much hair, there was still visible muscle definition. I'm not positive about how long I stared at this thing. It could have been a whole minute, and it also could have been a few seconds. It was when I returned both my feet to the pedals that the animal appeared to charge me. That frightened me so badly that I'm surprised I didn't bust the chain from the amount of sudden force I put into the pedals. Eventually, I did gain the courage to look over my shoulder. What was likely the most frightening part about this whole ordeal was the fact that I had to have had traveled at least half a mile before taking that opportunity, yet the animal was in plain sight, watching me and ensuring that I was continuing to flee the area. I never would have guessed that this particular animal was capable of such speed, and the idea that it was able to remain on my tail for that long is outright frightening. How could something be so large and also so fast? To make things even more perplexing, the trail that I was on was fairly narrow, leaving me to question how it was able to maneuver its wide shoulders while maintaining my pace. After glancing over my shoulder at it the first time, I continued to do so a few additional times until I was confident that the animal was staying put. That provided me with a little bit of relief, but it was when the animal was completely out of sight that I began to hear what seemed like a symphony of spine-chilling noises. Not only did I hear a barrage of what I'd later learn is known as wood knocks or tree knocks, but also a plethora of what I can only describe as screeches and howls. There were so many echoing sounds that it was difficult to pinpoint the direction of which they were coming. 
though I was pedaling fast, I frankly had zero clues as to whether I was pedaling my way into some ambush or trap. The bantering reminded me of what you see from packs of hyenas when watching the Discovery Channel. To me, there was something overwhelmingly sinister about the whole thing. By the time I made it out of the woods and onto the nearest road, I remember feeling a powerful sense of gratitude that I was still alive. There were a few moments that I truly thought I'd get marked down as another missing person and that I was going to put my sister into even greater turmoil. I believe it was a couple of years that passed by before I felt comfortable with telling my sister what I had crossed paths with that morning, and she reminded me of how she accused me of seeming funny for the remainder of my stay. She then proceeded to tell me that she had a friend who claimed to experience something similar. I'll see if I can somehow get in touch with them, and ask them if they'd be willing to submit their report. My buddies and I used to be avid ATVers and loved taking our off-road vehicles out to explore new places. I've kind of lost interest and would rather be standing by some nice stream fishing with nary a care, but when I was younger, I really enjoyed getting out like that. At the time, I lived in Salt Lake City, and it's a rat race, so every chance I could get, I liked to head out and get to backcountry. When I was just getting started, we would stay in RV parks and just do day rides, but after a while, you don't want to have to come back and retrace your route. So I started carrying a tent and gear on my ATV and spending a night or two out. It's kind of like backpacking, in that you can't take a ton of stuff, but it's a lot easier and noisier, I might add. At the time that this happened, the Paiute ATV trail was just getting started, and my buddy Carl and I decided to go down to give it a look. I'm not sure whose idea the trail was, but I'm pretty sure it was a coordinated effort by the communities of central Utah to try and drum up some of the tourism business. We went off the Tushers and the Paiute Trail, We loaded up the ATVs on my trailer and headed down to Marysvale, which isn't much of a town at all. Just a few hundred or so people. We spent our first night at the RV park in our tents, then headed out the next morning on the Paiute Trail, which you can ride to straight out of the RV park, which is nice. It was getting late, so we found a nice spot not far off the road and set up camp. It was great being outdoors, and the September weather was perfect though a bit chilly at night up in the high country. We had a great dinner, built a fire, and enjoyed being outside. After dinner, we sat and talked a while longer and smoked cigars, something we didn't get to do at home. We were tired, so we were about ready to call it a day, when Carl, who was leaning against a rock staring into the fire, sat straight up. I was in the middle of saying something, and he held his hand up like you do when you want someone to stop. I shut up and listened, but I didn't hear a thing. What was it? I whispered. But just then, I got my answer. Deep in the distance, and I mean deep, as if miles away, came a howling sound. You could tell whatever it was was really big and had a huge set of lungs. The sound was really low frequency to start with, and then turned into a higher shrieking yell that made my hair stand up. We both sat there in silence, listening, trying to figure out what it was. A chill ran up my spine for the first time ever. Even though we were camped by a small stream, we could hear this thing over the burbling noises. We just sat there quietly, and then the howling came again, but this time, a bit closer. We both really listened up, wondering what it was. To me, it sounded like a combination of a wolf and a bull. Kind of a snarling low sound, but drawn out almost into a bellow. It would go on and on for 20 or 30 seconds. I was starting to get worried. Were there wolves in this country? Supposedly not, but maybe a few still existed. But for some reason, that didn't seem right, as it had to be a large animal making such a loud, drawn-out sound that would carry like that. Whatever it is, it's coming this way. We both were getting nervous. Carl got up and poked the fire, 
and started to put another small log on, and then changed his mind. I got up and did a camp check. My pickup keys and my wallet were in my day pack, which was in my tent, and I crawled in and got them. If we had to make a quick exit, that was the one thing that I couldn't leave behind. Carl saw what I was doing and did the same thing, gathering a few items and putting them into his day pack. He then asked me if I was thinking that we want to get out of there before long. I nodded my head yes, just as the howling started again, only closer. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't shy. It acted like it wanted us to know that it was coming. The howls were getting louder, and the sheer volume cut through the air like a hot knife through butter. The howling came again, and then again, much closer. I could feel my heart start to beat faster. Carl jumped up, looking scared. This thing was moving fast. I got up and went back into my tent and reconsidered. If we were leaving, I wanted my nice new down sleeping bag. I quickly stuffed it into its stuff sack and then grabbed the rest of my gear, a few clothes, and a warm jacket. I went back out and crammed everything into the carrier on my ATV. I was ready to hit the road. Carl had now also got his gear out of his tent and stuffed it into his ATV carrier as well. He stood there, looking at me, and then pulled his gun out. I don't know exactly what he had, as I'm not a gun person, but it was some kind of handgun that he brought for protection from bears. He now stood there by his ATV, looking like he was ready to shoot. The howling was now very close, and I was scared stiff. We could now hear the sounds of tree branches breaking, as if something big was crashing through the aspens and underbrush, coming at us fast. I panicked and jumped onto my ATV and started it up, afraid for a second that it might not start, as it sputtered a little. Carl put the gun in his jacket pocket and got on his ATV and started it as well. I turned and headed down the little dirt road, my ATV lights barely enough to see where I was going, with Carl right behind me. I got a good half mile down the road before I pulled over to make sure Carl was doing okay. He pulled up beside me and told me he was fine and to keep going. Just then, we heard a deep growling next to the road, and we both took off. But this time, Carl was in front and I was bringing up the rear, which I didn't like one bit. Another half a mile, and Carl came to a screeching halt. I nearly ran into him. He said that there was something really big standing in the middle of the road. I strained to see, but the dust had caught up to us, and I couldn't make out anything. Whatever it was, was incredibly fast, to not only follow us, but to actually get ahead of us. We sat there for a minute, and then Carl started again, very slow, kind of inching his way down the road. Suddenly, from ahead, a shriek sounded out loud and clear, cutting through the air. This thing was very close. Carl stopped, pulled out his gun, and began frantically shooting. Now let me say that Carl is a responsible gun owner, and he wouldn't shoot at anything unless he knew what it was. He was panicked, but he still shot into the air over the head of whatever it was on the road. All we wanted at that point was for it to move so that we could get out of there. Whatever it was must have moved because Carl hit the accelerator and tore out of there. I was right behind him, and I swear that when I went by the spot that he said something had been standing, I saw a pair of red glowing eyes in the trees. Eyes that were in the head of something or somebody that stood a good eight feet off the ground. This shook me up. I gunned it until I was right on Carl's bumper, and I kept looking behind me, afraid that I was being followed. Neither of us stopped until we came down into the little town of Marysvale, and then we pulled over. Carl's eyes had a crazed look to them. I told him that we should go back to the RV campground and see if anyone was still up. Maybe we could rent a cabin for the night. And that's exactly what we did. It was the middle of the night, but we managed to get a cabin, yet I don't think either of us slept much. It was November of 1982, and I was 15 years old. I come from a hunting and fishing family, 
and started to enjoy the great outdoors from a very young age. I harvested my first deer at 10 years of age. My father was a decorated World War II Navy veteran. He was actually on the U.S. Yorktown and in charge of the engine room at the Battle of Midway. He retired as a Master Chief, just to give you a little background about why I was raised to fear almost nothing. I think this also helps me to explain why I could never share this encounter with anyone, including my six older siblings. I was the youngest of seven. It was a brisk November day, and my father and I were out deer hunting in what was then the U.S. Army Jefferson Proving Grounds. It is now known as Big Oaks Wildlife Preserve. My father and I had agreed upon ground stands and large trees that we would lean back against, which were big enough that if a stray shotgun slug had happened to come your direction, the tree would stop it. I had sat at my tree since 5 a.m. At around 11 a.m., I ate the lunch that my mom had packed for me. It was a sunny day, and it had warmed up to probably the lower 50s. Like any teenager with a full stomach, I fell asleep. I'm not sure how much time had passed, but I was awoken by rustling footsteps in the dry oak leaves behind me. Thinking it was my dad coming to check on me, I leaned around the tree and froze. Not 30 feet from me stood an ape-like creature on two legs. It had hair that I can only describe as being the color of ripe wheat. It stood approximately 9.5 to 10 feet tall. Its face was flat and was connected to what I guess you could describe as a high forehead. I didn't get a good look at its eyes, but they seemed dark. I would guess its weight to have been somewhere between 400 and 450 pounds. I think it smelled the deer urine that I had put down that morning, but with the weather warming up, the wind direction had changed. Thank God, because I know in my heart that if it would have seen me, my family would have never seen me again. I eased back around my tree and I began to shake. I knew that the three 12-gauge slugs in my gun would do nothing to something that muscular other than simply piss it off. In a few minutes, its footsteps gradually drifted out of earshot and I went to find my dad. I faked a stomach ache so that we could go home. Years afterwards, I remembered that every year we would have to go to a safety briefing before the hunt, and the colonel would always tell us, no cameras, and if you don't know what it is, don't shoot at it. Before he would add, you don't want to know what's in here. I have never told another living soul this story, and even after all of these years, I'm still shaking as I think back on it. I haven't told many people about my encounter, but it's just been one of those things I've never been able to debunk. It took place shortly after school started in 2004, when I was seven or eight years old. My friend Travis, his older brother, and I were riding our bikes at the dirt jumps, which still exist to this day. Suddenly, it started to storm. They left, but since my house was so close, and for reasons that I still don't understand, I hung out by myself. I guess I just wasn't ready to go yet. Off to the right, I saw this white figure moving slowly through the woods. It wasn't walking on a path, which I thought was strange. The first thing I noticed about the creature's physical appearance was that its arms stretched down to its waist and that it didn't seem to have much of a neck. It never saw me, but it walked through the brush and past a tree stand that was in front of me. I'd say it was about 50 or 60 feet from me, and I can accurately gauge the exact distance because both the tree stand and the jump that I was sitting on top of are still there. Its shoulders came up to the platform of the tree stand, so I know it was taller than 6 feet, but it wasn't gigantic. Once it passed through, I rode my bike back to my house, and I told my gram about it, but she of course brushed it off and didn't think much about it. That is, until I was a few years older and saw a show about Bigfoot on TV. 
Since then, I've become pretty educated on the serious side of the Bigfoot community, and I strongly believe that what I saw was a young Bigfoot, or maybe just a shorter one. As for the color of its fur, it seemed really odd to me until I started hearing about other sightings of white Bigfoot across Pennsylvania. My Sasquatch sighting happened eight years ago while I was working for my friend's father out in New York. His dad owned a summer house upstate, and there were a few occasions where he allowed my buddy and I to head up there by ourselves for the weekend. He'd always insist that we were not there to have parties or any other guests, but I always got the impression that he was making those statements so that he'd feel like a responsible adult. He was one of those guys who was way too busy with his business to care much at all about whether we were partying too hard at his lake house. The house was pretty isolated, but it wasn't one of those places that didn't have neighbors for miles. It was just that there were usually a couple of acres of woods that separated the homes. There was this one occasion where we invited a couple of girls to head up there with us. The four of us were sitting on the balcony out back when our conversation and beer chugging was interrupted by these horrible howls. I still don't know if howl is the best word to describe the noise, but I can't think of a word that would be more appropriate. I guess you could say it was like an animal screech that transitioned into a masculine shout. The girls were instantly freaked out by this noise, and even though I'll admit I was as well, I did all I could to appear brave. The noises projected for what was probably around 20 seconds before we saw a large silhouette run out from the tree line. Even though we were much higher up from where the figure erupted from, the speed at which it was moving was highly unsettling. What was even more unsettling was that it looked to be headed towards us. The four of us watched with both horror and amazement as this large primate leaped like a jackrabbit on all fours over to a large tree that was about halfway to the balcony and banged its hands against the bark multiple times. Although the moon provided enough light for us to see the silhouette of the large figure, I was unable to determine whether it used the palm of its hand or a closed fist to smack against the wood. The sound did seem far more like a knock, but I suppose it's just hard to fathom that it would have used its bare knuckles to create a noise that loud. After the colossal figure made the noise, it returned to all fours and ran back into the woods that were off to the left side of our view. It was before it disappeared into the woods that we all caught sight of the eye shine, and that's when one of the girls screamed. It only looked our way for a couple of seconds, but we all agreed that the eyes appeared to glow red. Now I've since heard others report the same type of occurrence, but I can't seem to come to any conclusion on what would have caused such a thing. I've heard numerous theories that demonic entities sometimes possess the Sasquatch creatures. However, I'm not the most religious person, so I can't really sit there and say I agree with that idea. Still, nobody will ever be able to convince me that I saw anything other than red eyes at that moment. It was almost immediately after my friend screamed, that it was as if something from within the forest attempted to replicate the human noise. But this sound didn't seem to come right from where the figure re-entered the woods. It sounded as though it were coming from the opposite direction. There was something about this situation that was so ghostly. Recognizing that both girls were now scared out of their wits, we decided to head indoors. We continued to party into the early hours of the night without anything else out of the ordinary happening, that is, until we went to bed. My buddy was really into one of the girls that we were with, and being the kind of wingman that I was, I took it upon myself to keep the other girl company while my friend went at it. Eventually, I took her to the lower level bedroom with me, and it was after a bit of fooling around 
that we both felt the shadow from something dark standing in front of the window. Given the previous event, I have no idea why neither of us thought to close the blinds before we got into bed. We were both too frightened to make a peep. Pressed up against the glass like a couple of suction cups was a pair of thick, pink lips. It was honestly like a large, hairy slug had decided the window would somehow offer some nutritional value. Behind the lips were two rows of crooked, chipped teeth. I do not recall seeing any canines. They were far more like human teeth, only significantly larger. The jaws were so wide that it caused for the beast's face to tilt backwards, making it impossible to see the eyes during that moment. Because of this, I was unable to get a sense of what color they were. Let's just slowly back away from the window. I finally gained the courage to utter. It was as if the girl didn't even hear me, like she was entranced by how incredibly bizarre the sighting was. I certainly cannot say I blame her. It took all the will I had not to throw myself under the comforter and hope for the odd-looking primate to trot off. I grabbed hold of her hand, slightly tugging, gesturing for her to follow my lead out of the room. I remember thinking how the beast was so large that I worried whether it was going to bust through the glass. But as we tiptoed out of the room, it continued to maintain its position without making a sound. It was as if the thing had turned itself into a statue. After we exited the room, we just kind of stood in the hallway area silently trying to determine what to do. I didn't want to call the police or anything like that, because I didn't want my buddy's father to suspect we were up to no good. Looking back on it, that was pretty silly. On the other hand, after everything I've heard, I'm not so sure the police would have done much of anything to help. Eventually, we took a seat on the lower-level common room sofa and fell asleep until the sun came up. I've never had another experience like that, but let me tell you, there's not a single day that goes by without me thinking about what we saw that night. Does anyone remember back in the 70s and early 80s when the Bigfoot craze was popping all over the country? Hoax after hoax, Ray Wallace stories, Biscardi, etc. That was all you ever heard about and everyone thought you were nuts for even believing. Well, this particular summer, 1980, smack dab in the middle of all that hype, was when my family had our encounters. I grew up in a dairy farming family. In New York, we had a small dairy, 80 head maybe, and we worked a farm that was my great-grandparents. Well, my dad's health got bad, so we had to sell. We ended up buying my mother's parents' place near Sackett's Harbor, New York where we still had a small farm, but more of a hobby farm. We had about a dozen cows, some milkers and some heifers, and a horse or two. I also raised rabbits, guinea pigs, duck, and geese. Well, first, something started harassing our cows at night in their pasture. We would hear them running and bellowing all damn night, but when we'd go down to check on them, all we'd see were spooked cattle. Now their pasture was only fenced with a single strand of electric fence, so we figured we had a koi dog or something running them around and scooting away before we would get there. One July night, one of our calves just disappeared. We went out in the woods looking for her. Our pastures butted up to a thick wooded area, four to five miles deep, just to find the carcass about a hundred feet in, legs gone, head and neck torn off like something twisted it off. It was very scary. Next thing to happen, a white goose of mine was found dead. It was found in the notch of a tree, six feet off the ground, head and legs ripped off, and the breast area devoured. These geese were in a pen that was partially covered on top. Maybe enough room for a hawk to fly in, but carry off a big white goose? A bobcat, maybe? This is how my family tried to rationalize it, and it worked till the rabbits and guinea pigs started vanishing. They were in hutches that had doors on the top of the cages. The little bolt locks had broken off, but we kept them closed with wooden pegs. 
Now, the one thing that you would need to open these cages were fingers. No four-legged animal would have been able to get those pegs out. Plus, they were on a table that was three feet off the ground. My parents started thinking that maybe one of the neighbor's kids were playing a mean joke on me. Then we started finding the piles of fur and bones in strange places throughout the property, like on the roof of the barn, which was approximately 11 feet high. At this point, we weren't even thinking Sasquatch, because he was just a hoax at the time, right? I'm thinking owl, or hawk, or bobcat. I had a horse named Caesar, that I had to keep separate from all the other horses and cows, because he was kind of mean. I had him in the other pasture, tied to a long bridle, 20 feet or so, and it was tied down to an old tractor tire. He could graze in a circle, and when his grass would get scarce, we'd move him and his water trough to another part of the pasture. One morning, I came down to the pasture, our horse and farm were on a hill with pastures below, to find him tangled up and lying down. He had a few cuts and abrasions from the bridle rope, but the strangest injury was his bottom lip. It was as if something had grabbed it and tried to rip it off. The cartilage was stretched so badly he couldn't close it. You could see the stretch marks in it, the striations of blood under the skin. The vet checked him out, gave him some antibiotics, and within a couple of weeks, his lip did heal, but it was very strange. About a month or so later, we had some cows that broke through the fencing and wandered into the woods. My brother Jake, 17, big old rugged farm boy, full beard at 15, Two of his friends, two of mine, and myself had to round them up. When we found each one, two of us would run them back out of the woods and then up to the barn. My brother and one of his friends went deep into the woods and were gone about 20 minutes. In the meantime, the rest of us found the last cow. And two guys ran her back, and the other two of us waited for my brother and his buddy. Then all of a sudden, we hear them yelling and running, My brother's nickname for me was, and still is, Charlie. I hear Jake scream, Run, Charlie, run! So I did. When we got back up the hill and to the barn, we asked them what the trouble was. He told us he saw big monkey people in the swamp, and one of them chased them. Now his friends, except the one that was with him, really started to razz them pretty hard, and they all laughed it off as a prank of Jake's part but he wasn't laughing one bit. To this day, Jake still lives on the property, but he won't go in that part of the woods anymore. And to this day, he will not discuss it with anyone, and he'll barely discuss it with me. When I introduced him to my wife for the first time, she asked him kiddingly, seen any Bigfoot lately? He got very stoic and said, I guess Charlie told you about that, huh? It clearly still bothers him. He said that when the one that charged looked at him, it was as if he could see right through me. He said it was not the eyes of an animal. My own personal experience happened the very next summer. My cousin Jerry, nine at the time, and I, eleven, were picking berries down in the woods. We had a lot of black caps, blackberries, and raspberries down there, and we would have a contest to see who could pick the most or fill up the bowl faster, something like that. Anyway, we were picking at what we call the thick patch. It was a huge thicket of berry bushes, and the berries were big, too. Well, Jerry's picking away, and suddenly, he just started crying and saying that he wanted to go home. He dropped his bowl, half full of berries, and just takes off running. Not knowing what his problem was, and thinking he was a weird kid anyway, I seized the opportunity, and I start picking the fire out of those berries. Approximately 10 to 15 minutes had passed since Jerry's meltdown, when I start to feel this wave of anxiety go through my body. I didn't know what it was, but I remember that it felt odd. As I'm picking, I hear a whistle to my right, which is in the direction that Jerry had ran. I look, but no one was there. Still anxious, I continued to pick and eat, pick and eat, and then again, another whistle. As I reached into the thicket, still looking in the direction of the whistle, I suddenly realize that I'm touching hair. 
As I touched it, I looked to see what it was that I touched, and all I saw was a huge shoulder. It made sort of a snorting growl noise and started to move, and what I saw was taller than I was, but it was still crouching. That's when the feeling came over me. I became immediately terrified. I wet my pants. I felt as if I was being bear-hugged slowly. I then dropped my bucket and ran. Now I have been blessed and cursed with a vivid memory. I am 40 years old, and I can still remember my childhood days, as far back as the day before my third birthday. My most vivid memory to this day is that accordion squeeze I felt that summer afternoon in 1981. I tried to tell my parents about it, but I was told to stop with the Bigfoot nonsense. After 30 years of trying to forget it, I finally decided back in November of 2009 to embrace my experience. I have gotten involved with the research field, and I'm hoping to grab this fear by the horns and try to heal, so to speak. Although my encounter was far from scary, as I wasn't really threatened in any way, I can still see that figure in the thicket, rocking as it squatted. I can still feel the squeeze, slowly shutting my body down, and I can still remember losing control of my bodily functions. It was an amazing, terrifying experience. I was 13 years of age when I saw the legendary creatures known as Sasquatch. It's something I'll never forget. It was autumn in the early 1990s when my grandparents invited me to go on a train ride with them through the Smoky Mountains. Both my grandfather and I were very passionate when it came to railroads, and we spent a great number of years bonding over electric train setups during my youth. They always lived nearby while I was growing up, so I was lucky enough to see a lot of them. By my early teenage years, I had the privilege of joining them on multiple scenic train tours. However, it was the one that led us through the Smoky Mountains that was the most noteworthy. The way I remember it, we were probably about halfway through the trip when I noticed a group of odd-looking organisms beneath a lengthy bridge that crossed over a wide river. The vision I have in my head reminds me so much of when you see homeless people loitering under highways, and that's something I still think of every time I come across that kind of thing. I'm not sure whether I was the first passenger to notice them, but I recall immediately tugging on my grandmother's shirt, nudging her to look out the window. She was in the middle of reading one of her novels, and my sudden, excited reaction seemed to startle her. My grandfather was fast asleep on the seat across from us, but even a sound sleeper like himself couldn't help but wake up from the commotion. I remember it so well as two of the large and extremely hairy figures were wrestling around on the terrain. To this day, I'm not sure if it was an actual standoff or if it was merely horsing around. Another two or three figures stood a handful of yards behind them, they were observing the scene, but I don't remember them appearing as though the battle phased them much. To me, the creatures looked like they could be a combination of man and gorilla. However, the only reason I even say that there was anything man-like about them was due to how they looked when they briefly walked on two feet. Something about the strut looked very caveman-like. I remember the hair being extremely dark brown, almost black. They were all the same color, and I'm pretty sure they were all roughly around the same size. I do wish I had a way of comparing their size to something else, but they were just too far off to judge. Still, there was no denying that they were of a significant size. It wasn't long before multiple passengers were leaning against the windows, completely fascinated by this most peculiar sight. Families and friends were chatting amongst themselves, but for the most part, everyone was surprisingly quiet. It wasn't long before my grandfather mentioned that it must be a family of Bigfoots, and that he couldn't believe that they were real. When I think back on it, 
it's pretty hard to think of him admitting that those creatures were real. Aside from our fun with the train sets, he truly was a rather gruff man. His personality seemed more like the type that would insist it must have been a bunch of people clowning around in monkey suits for the sake of scaring the crowds. Though the whole experience was so very eye-opening, it lasted a very brief time, and the only reason it even lasted that long was because the train was bending around the area where the scuffle was taking place. For the remainder of the trip, I sat there, wide-eyed, staring out the window and expecting to see more of the same thing. I don't think I even appreciated the scenery because I was so infatuated by the rare species. It's always been a dream of mine to see another one of these things. Though I'm sure if I had a much more close-up encounter, I likely wouldn't be anywhere near as eager. In years past, I've even paid to go on expeditions, but I've never had any luck aside from a few brow-raising noises. And unfortunately, I have no way of associating those noises to the kind of animal that I saw back in my youth. Still, I don't consider myself a believer. I consider myself a knower. I want to preface this by stating that I am going to summarize a few of my family's encounters with these creatures. As of today, I have documented 61 different incidents. I did not start keeping a journal of these personal accounts until almost three years after my first eyewitness encounter. If I had started earlier, the documented incidents would have far surpassed 61. Initially after my first encounter, I was so shell-shocked that I now realize that I had developed PTSD from the event. During a roughly three-year period after the first encounter, my wife and I had numerous unexplainable things happen to us at our home. However, I never thought to start documenting the events for future reference. It was only after speaking with a friend that I decided to take their advice and start keeping a journal. My wife and I are both college graduates. I have obtained a master's degree in adult education and she currently has a degree in education with a minor in English literature. In my prior job, I was often called upon as the expert witness to provide testimony in high-profile criminal or civil cases. We are both very aware of spinning tall tales and what it could do for our reputations. In the fall of 2008, my wife and I moved to rural southern West Virginia, and built a small log home in a sparsely populated area. We have approximately 20 people living within a five mile radius of us. The property sits adjacent to a 13,000 acre wildlife management area, and in addition to the 20 acres of land that we own, we also lease another 800 plus acres for hunting. In the summer of 2009, my wife fell extremely ill from a failed kidney. She was in and out of the hospital for several months during this time. After my wife had been released from the hospital to come back home, she was very weak and stayed in bed most of the time. During this time, our little girl was barely two years old, and our son was seven. My wife and little girl had lain down for a nap, and my son was in his bedroom, most likely playing a video game. I was sitting on our front porch, working on an electrical corn feeder head that had been recently torn up, when I heard a rather loud shriek coming from across the mountain on top of the ridge adjacent to our home. Both of my basset hounds had heard the shriek, and they began to growl deeply. Their fur bristled on end while they looked towards the mountainside. After a few moments of silence, I distinctly heard what sounded like a huge object crashing through the brush, coming off the hill from the ridge towards my house. The sound was loud, but it was also slow and methodical. It was almost as if something the size of an elephant was walking in the brush towards me. The dogs continued to growl and grew more and more unsettled. I stopped what I was doing and started watching the wood line curiously. As the moments passed, the object responsible for the noise continued to get closer to our home as it walked in a straight line off the ridge. 
I realized that at any moment, I would be able to see the culprit responsible for the racket, so long as it continued to walk in the direction that it had been heading. I observed our dogs. They had retreated from our yard and had attempted to hide themselves in a large hole in the hillside that ran alongside our front yard. The hole was there due to me uprooting a tree earlier in the year. Finally, I could make out a large, hair-covered thing standing on its hind legs as it stepped out of the wood line and looked straight at me. The creature was approximately 60 yards away from my position and was standing in clear view of me without any obstructions. That past spring, the local power company had contracted a brush-cutting company to clear out all of the underbrush adjacent to the power lines, and the creature was standing in this clear-cut area. When I first observed the creature, I immediately attempted to process what I was seeing. My first thought was that it was a bear, standing on its hind legs. I further convinced myself that it made sense for me to be seeing a bear, because I had two full trash cans sitting at the base of the hill near the road. This thought was further confirmed when the creature squatted down to the ground, because I convinced myself that the bear had sat down on its rump. After the creature squatted down, it became completely motionless. It was so motionless that it literally melted into its surroundings. Had I not been looking straight at this creature as it squatted, I most likely would have never seen it in plain view. After the creature sat motionless and observed me for several moments, I became bored with looking at this bear, and I went back to tinkering with the electronics I was working on. After a few minutes, I noticed movement in my peripheral vision. I looked towards the movement, and I witnessed the creature had stood back up. At that moment, I knew that I wasn't looking at an odd-shaped, overgrown, dark brownish black bear. I was looking at what I thought at the time was a monster. The monster turned side profile to me while keeping its eyes locked on me the entire time. This is when I got a really good look at this creature, and I then and I then knew without a doubt that I was looking at a monster and not a bear. The creature was between seven and eight feet tall, with a thick chest and large, long forearms. The creature's waist was thick, and its legs and hips were extremely sturdy and powerful. I could not make out any facial features because of the distance, but I could see the brow ridge and the eye sockets, as well as the oddly colored skin that didn't have any hair. This monster proceeded to walk from my left to my right while maintaining eye contact with me the entire time. It proceeded to walk a parallel line to my right for approximately 150 feet, and it entered a pine thicket across the road from my front yard. The creature stopped as it entered the thicket, and it proceeded to make the loudest, most guttural, roaring howl I have ever heard, which could never be replicated by a human being. The roar echoed throughout my chest, and it literally felt as though it shook my porch. I began to panic, and I imagined that the creature was going to attack our home. Suddenly, it let out the most ghastly, ungodly, moaning howl that could only be dreamt up in someone's worst nightmares. As the howl started to taper off, I could hear a low growl emanating from it. I could feel the vibrations from the growl and I grew weak at the knees as it sent a chill down my spine. I left the front porch area of our home, and I proceeded to arm myself. I thought of calling 911, but I realized that they might think I was either intoxicated or just a basket case. Needless to say, I could go on and on about events that happened after this initial incident, but let's just say that I became afraid of going outdoors for quite some time. I am an avid hunter, and I have been published in a popular hunting magazine for some of my trophy kills, but I became terrified of the woods after this. For the longest time following this incident, I had managed to block much of it out and tried to forget about it. Gradually, after talking to friends and doing a lot of research, I was able to start regaining some normalcy in my life. Only after I re-entered the woods and started hunting and fishing again, did I fully remember the events that happened during this life-altering encounter. 
Obviously, I've had many, many more things happen since then. But this was the first time that I consciously realized what was happening to our family. Finally, I had an explanation for so many strange events that had been happening to us and our home since moving into the area. Additionally, I became an instant internet junkie as I tried to find any and all information that I could on the subject of Sasquatch. The more I discovered, the more I realized I was experiencing the same things that many people elsewhere had reported happening to them too. After my incident, I learned through some unofficial investigative work that there have been a multitude of sightings and encounters in this area for years. Some of the local names for the beasts are Red Eye or the Booger. Another popular name used by old-timers was the Devil. Supposedly, they even found the nest of one of the devils back in the 60s, and the place is still referred to as the Devil's Den. It is a large cave that is in the heart of the wildlife refuge. The Devil's Den is within two miles of my current residence. Coincidentally, there is a documented account of a local school bus driver who claims that the creature ran off the hill on two legs and jumped from the hillside onto the roof of her bus. It happened while she was parked adjacent to the hillside while she was waiting to pick up the kids for school. The driver claims that she heard something running off the hill when she exited the bus to see what the commotion was all about. According to the report, the woman claimed a werewolf-looking creature that was covered in hair and seven feet or taller ran on two legs down the hill and jumped onto her bus as she quickly re-entered it. The driver said she sped away with the monster still on the roof, but that she was uncertain as to where the creature finally came off. Needless to say, the lady went straight back to the bus garage and promptly reported the incident and then quit her job. The location where the lady had parked the bus happened to be down the hill on an old dirt road just below the Devil's Den. In 2013, my family decided to move to the mountains of West Virginia, about four miles from Plum Orchard Lake. We found our perfect little cabin nestled in the mountains on 10 acres, with a small creek that ran through the property. Behind our property were thousands of acres of state-owned land that were full of rugged beauty. The first weeks went by without any incidents, and we greatly enjoyed our new life. In that area of the United States, seasons changed faster than in our home state of Georgia. We noticed more and more wildlife getting closer to our house and around the creek. One of my friends came up to visit us and fell in love with the property. He enjoyed it so much that we ended up letting him put a tiny house at the bottom of the property in a clearing with a great view of the creek, about 50 yards from the main house. He ended up coming to work for me, and we rode there together every morning. About a month after he moved to the property, we came home late one evening, pulled into the driveway, and got out, only to hear the strangest noises coming from the ridge above the house. It sounded like something was pacing the ridge and making a loud blowing noise. We sat and listened for a few minutes. I thought it was strange, but we parted ways and went about our separate evening routines. The next morning, I picked up my friend like usual, but he seemed shaken and extremely exhausted. I asked what was the matter, and he said that tree limbs and stones kept hitting the side of his small house throughout the night. He seemed sincerely horrified. A few days went by, and my wife said that she had this uneasy feeling while being outside, almost like she was being watched by something. She also said that something was knocking things over in the yard. I began to suspect that maybe a bear was meddling around, since the area had such a high population of them. That year, we started getting our first snowfall around Halloween, something we were not prepared for being from the south. We spent a lot of the evening, after that, chopping logs on the very back of the property for firewood. While we were back there, we noticed what we thought were game trails down behind the house, 
which you could follow all the way to the creek. We thought nothing of it and continued collecting wood. That night, we started hearing something hitting our house. At first, it sounded like small stones, but then it transitioned into what sounded like much larger rocks. I called my friend to see if he was messing around, but down the receiver, I could hear the same noise of stones hitting the top of his house as well. We decided to see what was going on and meet one another on my porch. I had my rifle and he had his. Both of our pits were with us as well. We grabbed our flashlights and headed towards the ridge, and the dogs seemed extremely anxious. They were acting like something was close, but we couldn't see anything. All we found was a horrible odor and some disturbed stones around the houses. Thanksgiving came and went, and Christmas was fast approaching. All the strange activity seemed to die down for a few weeks. That is, until my friend got into my work van one morning, and he seemed completely freaked out. He said he had spent the entire night with his gun in his lap, and his dog growling and watching his front door. He asked if I had heard anything the night before, and I explained that I had slept like a baby. He went on to stress that something was messing with his front door, and he said he was honestly scared to death. That weekend was like any other. We spent much of the time watching movies before heading to bed around 10.30. Suddenly, we were awoken at 2 o'clock in the morning by an alarming sound. It sounded like something was hitting the side of the house with a 2 by 4 My kids and my wife were crying, and they all fled into our bedroom. I called my friend, and he said he could hear the sound from his place. I could hear his dog snarling and barking in the background. We decided to get the guns and head outside to see what it was that was going on. He ran up to my house, and we set off into the woods. My dog was growling towards the tree line, so we headed in that direction. As we got closer, the dogs seemed afraid of something, and we kept yelling out, Who's there? The dogs then started barking loudly towards the trees next to us, and we shined our lights in that direction. And that's when we saw it. I am over six foot two, and this thing had to be at least eight foot eight or taller. Its hair was dark and matted, and when my light hit its eyes, they shined red. It was only there for a second, but time froze, and I absorbed every detail of the moment. It then stepped back into the thicket of the woods behind it. The world became alive again, and fear set in, and the urge to flee from the area quickly set in. We ran back down the property, and something yelled out towards us, a roar like anything I had ever heard before. There was also the sound of pacing on the ridge. We both went into my house, locked the doors, and sat with my family till morning. The next day, my friend decided to move, and my family and I left in the spring, never to look back. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening.